Well, good morning, everyone. We are almost done with our series uh, entitled Growing in Grace. Our theme verse has been 2 Peter 3.18, with growing the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a good summary of what Peter has been talking about as he addressed the first two letters that he wrote. The first, of course, was to encourage people who are going through trials. So he talks about God's grace again and again. The second letter, he warns the church against the false teachers that were sowing seeds of heresy uh, secretly among them. So he talks about the importance of the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Last week, we ended by talking about the second coming of the Lord. You know, we asked, how do you, how do you react when a CHP officer comes up fast uh, behind you? And, of course, your foot gets lighter, and uh, you begin to think, am I in compliance with the law? Why? Because the officer is about to knock on your window. We said... Jesus is in the rearview mirror, that his coming now is closer than ever before, and that our lives need to be different. So we need to show that by your, our lives that Jesus is coming again, because if we don't care that Jesus is coming again, why would anyone else care? And so we need to use the opportunity to share the gospel. It says that God is patient. It's like somebody holding a door, an uh, elevator door open so that you could still come in. And the question we ask is, when Jesus comes, which side of the door will you be? Jesus is patient so that you could come in. Jesus is patient actually towards Christians so we could invite people to come in. This morning, we have a, a message that's not in your booklet. This is bonus. This is extra. So Matthew 16, if you have your Bibles, we'll turn to Matthew 16. Before we do so, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the song that was just sung. We thank you that we are able to love you because you loved us first. We thank you for your unconditional, eternal love for each one. And I pray, Father, that as we, again, look into your word, that you would encourage us as a church, you would encourage us as individuals, you would help us not only to be informed, but to be transformed, not only to understand, but to be able to apply the things that we will study for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Monday, I was invited to go mountain biking at Crockett Hills Regional Park. I asked them what kind of terrain it is, and they said, oh, it's a beginner's course. Yeah, you already know where this is going. <laughs> I quickly learned that beginner is a relative term. If you're an advanced rider who's in shape, you have the proper equipment, yeah, then this is beginners. Um, they, those are the people that I rode with. Those are the people to blame. <laughs> but if you're a newbie, if you're new at the sport, and you're out of shape, and you have a Walmart bike, <laughs> then this is advanced. In fact, it was very advanced for me. I thought I was going to die. I thought my lungs would explode. Because they would go on these extent. Some of that is, is nice and gentle, but then the very first part, you go up on this incline that's about a a thousand, a thousand feet, about 300 yards of just straight climbing. And you're just constantly, you're just constantly uh, pedaling. And it, it, was, it was really, really difficult. It was hard. I mean, I enjoyed it, but I was not mentally prepared for it. I was not physically prepared for it, although I enjoyed the ups and downs and the twists and turns. That was fun. I just was not ready. Now, when you reach the top, and that's a view of the Walmart bike, uh, when you reach the top, you have this amazing vista of San Pablo Bay on one side. On the other side, you see the Carquinez Straits with the, with, with the bridge, and it's just gorgeous. It's beautiful, especially as the sun is about to go down. And when we got up there, my friends... <laughs> looked at me and said, 
wasn't, isn't this amazing? Isn't it worth it, Pastor? I said, um, almost. <laughs> Because what would have made it worth it is if there is a restaurant up there. <laughs> Preferably a steakhouse. Because I was really hungry. <laughs> Life is an adventure. And people will invite you to many different types of adventures. You will get involved in the college adventure. The marriage adventure. We just have a newlywed here. Uh, the having kids, family adventure, the career adventure, the vacation adventures, and so on. And each one of these adventures is full of ups and downs and twists and turns. And in the end, the question is, was it worth it? And sometimes yes, and sometimes no. I'm amazed at, at the, the number of things people get into. I'm amazed at what people would devote their lives to while here on earth. You know, some, they devote their lives to saving the manatees or saving the whales or saving the turtles or saving the ocean or saving a particular lake. I love Mono Lake or saving the, the trees in the rainforest. And that's fine. But at the end of it all, the question is, was it worth it? At the end of it all, has this made my life more meaningful? In the passage that we read, the disciples have devoted their lives to a cause. Jesus had invited them to be involved in this exciting adventure when he said, come, follow me. But he warns them that it will be filled with ups and downs and twists and turns. And he prepares them for the journey and assures them that at the end, it will be worth it. Whenever you follow Christ, he will not leave you frustrated. He will not leave you regretful or resentful or feeling cheated at the end. Yes, it will be tough. There will be challenges. But in the end, it will be worth it. Matthew, more than any book in the Bible, speaks of God's kingdom. In verse 1 to 3, you see the birth of Jesus Christ, the son of David, and it talks about the king, and he is introduced. When the wise man came, they said, we want to see the king of the Jews. In chapter 4, after Jesus' baptism, he offers the kingdom. In chapter 5 to chapter 11, he authenticates his offer. In other words, he proves that he's the king, not only with his teaching, he proves that he is the king by his miracles. In chapter 12, it's a turning point in Matthew because the religious leaders rejected Jesus' offer. They said, you do what you do by the power of Satan. And so beginning with chapter 13, after that official rejection, Jesus begins talking about a new form that the kingdom will take. He begins talking about the fact that Israel will be set aside for a moment and God's will on earth will be manifested through this thing called the church, this organization called the church. In fact, in chapter 16, which is our passage, is the first time the word church appears in the New Testament. And Jesus calls his disciples and says, you are going to be part of this adventure. You are going to be part of this journey. And he, he talks about the requirements of what it will take for the disciples as they go on this journey. Beginning with chapter 13, verse 13, after again another tense encounter with the with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who again rejects Jesus as the Messiah, who again challenges him and says, we want to see a sign if you are truly the Messiah. And Jesus said, you will get no sign except the sign of Jonah. In other words, I'll be buried a third day, or I'll be raised again. But in beginning in chapter 13, it says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Jesus went up 
away from the Sea of Galilee, away from the, the crowd, away from the religious leaders, and he takes his disciples about 25 miles up north to a place called Caesarea Philippi. That is about 120 miles from Jerusalem. And while they were there, he turns to his disciples. It's important to know that he's talking to all the disciples, not just Peter. And I'll, you'll discover later on why that's important. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? In other words, he asked them, what is the word around town concerning me? And they answered, pretty good, Lord. It, you get a pretty good report. It says in verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. As good as those reports were, they were inadequate. They were not correct. And so Jesus asked another question. He says, who do you say that I am? What people say about Jesus is not as important as what you say about Jesus. Who do you say that Jesus is? It is the most important question in the world, and you need to answer it correctly. Peter, being the leader of the disciples, answers Jesus. And this answer is phenomenal. He says, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that is, up to this point in Matthew, the strongest statement from one of Jesus' companions identifying him as the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one, the son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus answered him. Good answer, Peter. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, mortal man will not know this. In, in, instinctively or intuitively. This has to be a revelation from God. He says, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter answered correctly, and now Jesus begins to talk about the church, and he says he encourages them by, by saying four things, four truths about the church. First of all, when you involve yourself in the church, when you involve yourself in kingdom building, he says, it will be worth it because the church is anchored on a great person. In verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, notice what it says, I will build my church. The one who is saying, I will build my church, is the very one that Peter identifies as the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, I will build my church. Now, the context is important because this was asked at a place called Caesarea Philippi. We were there earlier this year in, in Israel, and we were able to visit Caesarea Philippi. It's an interesting place. There's a lot of water there flowing from these mountains. And, and if you, you take a short hike, you see people hiking up there, you will see the ruins of temples. At the beginning of it, you see this chart that shows you the picture of what the temples must have looked like when they were still up during Jesus' time. So when they went up here, this is what they would see. They would see temple after temple dedicated to some idol, to some god that they worship. Now, I, I blew up the, the legend, and you will see on this map or on this legend all the, all the religious places that when you go up there, you could go to. There's the Temple of Augustus. That was... They worship Caesar. They worship him, and so they, they, they built a temple for him at this place. There's the grotto of the god Pan. There's the court of Pan and the nymphs. These are the courts. There's the temple of Zeus. There's the court of Nemesis. There's the tomb temple of the sacred goats. There's the temple of Pan and the dancing goats. So idol after idol, and so when Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God, he was actually saying, as opposed to these dead idols, you are the son of the living God. You are the true God. And of course, it was also throwing shade at Caesar because Caesar is said to be the son of God. But Peter says, you are not just a son of a God. You are the son of the true God. You are the son of the 
living God. It is this person who makes the claim to build the church. Now the question is, when, when Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, who is the rock? <laughs> First service, they said, Dwayne Johns. No, no, not, not that rock. Not that rock. You guys, that's wrong. But who is the rock back then? Not, not today. Who is the rock back then? There's four interpretation. The first one is that Jesus was saying, I am the rock. Because he uses two different words. He says, you are Petros. On Petra, I will build my church. So the first interpretation is it is Jesus himself claiming to be the rock. The second interpretation is that Jesus was saying, upon this rock of your confession, when Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus is saying, upon that confession, I will build my church. The third interpretation is what the Catholic Church teaches in that the rock is Peter, in that he is the first pope, and he is the one that is able to hand the, king, the keys of the kingdom down to the subsequent popes. That is the interpretation. Part of the reason we, we don't want to include Peter in it is a reaction to that teaching. But here's what I think is the, the correct interpretation. I think the fourth interpretation is that it includes Peter, but it's not only Peter, but all of the disciples. Remember, remember Jesus asked them, who do you guys, plural, think that I, ha- I am? And they answered, you, you know, pretty good. Here's the word around town about you. When Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, he was acting as the spokesperson, the leader for all the other disciples. So when Jesus says, you are Peter, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church, I think he was including all the disciples. The word Petra in Greek could mean a stone slab. And so what I think Jesus is saying is this. He says, you are Peter, but upon the slab of the disciples, I will build my church. Do we have biblical confirmation of that? Yes. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. This is what the apostle Paul says. Built on the foundation of what? The apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So the foundation, the cornerstone, the most important stone is Jesus Christ. But he invites his disciples, his followers, particularly the apostles and and prophets to be part of that foundation in the first century. When we were studying 1 Peter, remember this is what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 5. You yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. So the picture is a house, the foundation, the cornerstone, Jesus, the foundation, the apostles, and we are the living stones that are building up this house. In verse 6, for it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Whoever believes in him will say at the end, it has been worth it. Jesus himself is the anchor of this promise. The church is anchored on a great person. That's why it's worth it. Secondly, it's worth it because this great person gives a great promise. What is the promise in verse 18? He says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will build my church. This is a guarantee of success. Jesus doesn't say he'll try to build the church. Uh, Jesus doesn't say he might build the church. He doesn't say he'll do his best. No, what does Jesus say? I will build my church. Peter Marshall, who was the Senate chaplain from 1947 to 49, 
had a lot of great quotes. This is one of my favorites. It says, it is better to fail in a cause that will ultimately succeed than to succeed in a cause that will ultimately fail. He says that when you are involved in the building project of the church, when you are involved in kingdom building, he says it is a cost that is guaranteed success. Jesus himself guarantees it. That's why it's exciting to, to see how the church is growing around the world. That's why it's exciting to have missions month next month because we will see all, all the all the ways that God is blessing our missionaries. We'll get reports from missionaries. We'll have missionaries speak. But what excites me is to know that even though there are setbacks, even though there are bad news sometimes about the church, he says that the church building is right on schedule. That God continues to build the church. It is, it is encouraging to know that even though Satan will try to attack the church from the outside, just like First Peter, the church continues to survive and thrive. Even though Satan tries to attack the church from the inside through false teachings, just like in Second Peter, the church continues to grow. The church continues to be built just as God has planned. It is still on schedule. So we, we are encouraged. We are encouraged that it is worth it. Why? Because the church is anchored on a great person who gives a great promise. And guess what? He pays a great price. He pays a great price. In Matthew 16, 18, it says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, for, for some, it's, again, just a continuation of Jesus saying, I will build the church and you will be successful. But I think Jesus is saying more here. The context of, 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 this, of this verse is Jesus predicting his death. A few verses later, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and notice it says, and be, be killed. The word hell is actually the word Hades in, in the Greek. And I believe what, what Jesus was talking about was foreshadowing his death. That the gates of hell will try to close behind me, but it will not keep me in. I will break through. Why? Because on the third day, I will be raised. The church is victorious because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Because during the resurrection, Jesus proved that he is mightier, mightier than Satan. That he's able to overcome death. He's able to overcome sin. And so when it comes to the church, we know that we will be victorious. Why? Because Jesus rose from the grave. That is our guarantee of victory. The reason the church belongs to Jesus Christ is because he paid for it with his, with his blood. That I will build my church. It belongs to Jesus. This church doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it belongs to him because he paid for it. Remember again, in Peter, I'm using this this message is a review of the things we've learned in First and Second Peter. In verse 18, he says, Knowing that you are ransomed, in other words, you were bought from the futile or empty way inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. No, silver and gold, as precious as they are, one of these days, they will all be burned up. It says in 19, But with what? The precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. We are guaranteed victory because of the resurrection. We belong to Jesus Christ because he paid for us with his own blood. I will build my church. Finally, it will be worth it. Why? Because the church is anchored on a great person who gives a great promise and pays a great price. So he can offer us a great partnership. I love this part. Verse 19. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
Now, what do you use keys for? To open, to open closed doors. Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. So whenever Satan closes a door, whenever Satan puts an obstacle, whenever Satan tries to stop you, you could look at the key ring and you will have a a key to open up that door. That you will be successful. The Satan will not be able to keep you out when you evangelize, when you share the gospel with people. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And here's an, another exciting part. So we're involved in a spiritual battle where God gives us the resources to win and to save souls. But here's the exciting part. He says, the things that you do have already been declared by God in the past. It says, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Actually, it doesn't quite catch the, 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 the tense in the Greek because it is a perfect tense. A perfect tense, even in English, is when you do something and it has continuing effect. What does this mean? It means we have the privilege of bringing out in time what God has declared in eternity. It is not the other way around. Because when you read it, it seems like whatever we do that God backs us up and he rubber stamps it. No. It is not our will being done in heaven. It is heaven's will being done on earth. And so whenever you're involved in kingdom building, understand that it is exciting because you're part of God's eternal plan from from long ago. And you have the privilege, you and I have the privilege of carrying out that eternal plan and seeing it fleshed out in time, seeing it manifested in your lifetime, seeing a slice of your life, as as short as our life is, Seeing God use us as a means to carrying out his divine purpose, his divine plan, his saving uh, outreach to the lost. What an awesome privilege. You are not only involved in a spiritual endeavor, you're partners in an eternal plan from God. That is exciting, my friends. That is something that you and I get the privilege of doing whenever we work for God's kingdom. Ephesians 2.10, and I always try to encourage my, my staff whenever we're, we're faced with big projects, you know, whether it's the, the project of, of Pastor Al and, and building a training center in Bohol, or whether it's uh, Peter's first person narrative next week, uh, or the missions month, or whether it's the Christmas play, I always remind them, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you do for the Lord has already been planned out, has already been prepared. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. One of the first verses I memorized when I was a, a child, I memorized this when I was in second grade. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should, and here's the key phrase, walk in them. Don't stress out over God's work. Why? Because he prepared it when? Beforehand, and our job is simply to walk, not run, not be stressed out about it, but simply to to walk, relax, and enjoy it. I mean, if there's something that I could do over again in my ministry, it's when we were building this church, not to worry a day or a second, knowing that if it is from God, it will happen. And, you know, looking back, it's like, oh, yeah, no brainer. But back then, you had $6,000 in the bank, and it's going to cost $2 million to build. You're going, oh, Lord, where are we going to get this? But instead of just simply relaxing, instead of simply saying, Lord, This is your work, it's not mine. This is your church, it's not mine. Lord, if you have planned this ahead of time, if you have planned this in eternity, then it will happen. I don't have to worry. I simply need to walk. Simply need to walk. If you're involved in ministry, don't sweat it. Just continue to pray. Continue to lift it up before the Lord. 
that if it's from the Lord, you get the awesome privilege of carrying out an eternal plan and seeing it brought into time. He says, whatever you lose on earth would have been loose or will have been loose in heaven. Future perfect passive. So it's simply an encouragement to the disciples. I'll give you the keys. You'll open the doors. And that open door had already been predetermined, pre-planned, prepared in eternity past. You simply get the privilege, the joy of seeing it fleshed out in time. Verse 21, 21, Jesus gives full disclosure. He tells them, I'm going to suffer many things. And he tells, he tells them, you will suffer many things. Full disclosure. And like some people, when they ask you to go on, on trips, they don't give you full disclosure. <laughs> yeah. He says, this is not beginners. He said, this is advanced. He says, I will suffer. Then he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus says, there will be times when there'll be ups and downs, there'll be twists and turns. But then this is the encouragement. He says, in the end, this suffering leads to glory. He says in verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with this angel. So after, after the resurrection, he says, I will come again. Notice the description in the glory of his Father. And then notice that what else he says to the disciples. You will suffer many things. You will go through hardships. You will go through tribulations. You will go through trials. But guess what? When I come, I will repay each person according to what he has done. This month is ministry month. And our mission statement is love God, love others, impact the world. Love God by attending worship service like you're doing now. Love others by belonging to a care group. So each one of you should be part of a care group. But impact the world, how? By serving in a ministry team. Every week we've been introducing a different, a different uh, ministry in the church that you could be involved in. So I, I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to say, Lord, where do you want me to be involved? Where do you want me to impact the world uh, through this church? And be in prayer and, and, and be part of a ministry team. Okay, that's enough of the commercial. Um, what have we learned? He says, he, Jesus invites us. He says, there are times when it will be hard. But he says, it will totally be worth it. It's worth it because the church is anchored on a great person who makes a great promise. I will build the church and pays a great price. The gates of hell shall not overcome. You shall not overcome me, first of all, and shall not overcome you. So that he could offer us a great partnership. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. It is worth it. It is totally worth it, if I could put it in today's slang, to work for God's kingdom. It is totally worth it to work for God's kingdom. It's interesting to me. The descriptions of the kingdom, the descriptions of eternity, uh, always, always talks about food. It says, you prepared a table before me. This is, this is a banquet. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell, or I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a, there's a table, a banquet table waiting. In Matthew 26, 29, notice Jesus' description of the kingdom. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In the kingdom, there will be a banquet. And even Jesus' description of personal faith in him. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. To him. Many times we stop there, but notice what it says and what? And eat with him and he with me. That's a description of fellowship. That's a description that eternal life is not just in the future, eternal life is having fellowship with Jesus now. But again and again and again, the Bible speaks of food. Jesus invites us on a journey, and at the end, there's a restaurant.
and the chef is God. So it has to be the best food. He invites us on a journey, and it will be totally, totally worth it. Have you joined this adventure, this journey? It begins with a person, Jesus Christ. He says, I knock at the door. If anyone, any man, any woman, any child, any teenager opens the door, what's his promise? I will come in. Is Jesus in your heart? Would you like for him to live in your life, to fellowship with you, and to include you in the most exciting adventure ever? Have you done that? Would you like to? Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we, we come to you, Lord, acknowledging that you're an, you're an awesome God. You, you have prepared all the things that we are to do for you, and you invite us into this exciting adventure. And so I pray, Father, for, for those who have found themselves being distracted by this world, being distracted to this cause or another, this adventure or another that doesn't include you. I pray, Father, that you would just tap them on the shoulders and remind them that we are to be about kingdom building. I pray, Father, that you would speak to each heart. For those who do not know you, I pray that you would save them. If it's your first time here today, you've, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior but would like to, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I invite you to pray this prayer with me, all Christians praying. If you'd like Jesus to come into your heart and life, would you follow me in a simple prayer, just quietly where you're at? Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I here and now put my faith in you alone as my Lord and as my Savior. Come into my heart and save me. Father, I thank you for anyone who's prayed that prayer. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their Christian life. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you, Lord, for the part that we have in building your kingdom. And I pray that each one of us will, will use our gifts and talents and abilities for you, for your glory, for these we, things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This time, let's all rise and let's sing our closing song.